Now, usually I try and get right into my topics, but this one's got a brief introduction, so just bear with me for a sec. First of all, thank you so much for your patience waiting for this video. It was supposed to come out last Friday and then on Friday of this week, but unfortunately the inescapable video got a bit overwhelming and then I didn't really have the time to finish it and I didn't want to rush it while I was still psychologically recovering from that whole experience. Second, thank you all for the insanely positive response to the last few videos. The Just Say Magic Exists in Overwatch video was the first of mine to be a 1 of 10, which means that it outperformed the 9 previous videos before it, and it was the first video of mine to do that well since that Ancient Survivorship Bias video in 2022. I thought I was incredibly lucky to finally have something do so well again but that it was probably going to be all downhill from there for at least a little bit. You know, sometimes the video pops off, but it usually doesn't maintain that momentum. And then the Inescapable video came out and somehow blew it out of the water. I've mentioned it a couple times on the channel before, but I actually lost my job a few months back and I've been struggling with finances a little bit because job market sucks. And thanks to the insanely positive response to those videos, I'm going to be able to pay some bills and keep my head above water for a month. So seriously, thank you so much. There's also going to be a couple announcements about what I'll be doing to celebrate my birthday next week and future content at the end of the video as well, but I just wanted to get that out of the way to start because I am just very, very grateful right now. Now, our topic for today is the never contentious topic of resource extraction, which is basically just that thing where you take resources out of the environment to do stuff with them. The resources can be just about anything. Gold, coal, diamonds, oil, trees, fish, all of that. As long as they're resources and they come from the environment, they count. However, if you're a capital G gamer TM, you'll probably also recognize those as some of the resources you can collect in a huge amount of games. In the Civilization games, you need to extract oil to build tanks. In Minecraft, you need to mine diamonds so you can get better at mining and die less. And in Against the Storm, you harvest natural plant fibers to make fabric so those goddamn harpies don't kill themselves because they don't have enough coats and pie and tea and fancy houses. And why are you even on this expedition? One of the fun things about fiction is that it's a bit of a double-edged sword when it comes to how it affects us, in the sense that tying a lesson to a story helps to make that lesson stick, but it also makes it much easier to accidentally learn the wrong lessons. This is especially true in video games, where the author has a lot less control of your experience of the game, and you can create unintended outcomes. For example, as discussed in Polygon's video Unboxing the Hidden Politics of SimCity, the algorithms behind SimCity are based on some real sketchy data patterning that leads to things like urban decay or homelessness based on the writing of a guy who didn't know what he was talking about. In more open-ended games, you can also create unintended emergent outcomes that are a bit of a yikes, such as what's seen in Dan Olson's Minecraft Sandboxes and Colonialism video, where he discusses how Minecraft unintentionally creates incentives for players to replicate some not great practices of colonialism in a way that the developers absolutely did not intend to happen. This video was actually originally inspired by my own experience playing Minecraft with some friends, when I thought to myself, you know, huh, coal is really just super easy to find here. I wonder if there are any people who grew up playing Minecraft who have a deeply skewed view of how coal exists in the world because of this game. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought it would be a topic I wanted to explore a bit more. I added it to a list of potential topics, and one of my donors in the October Donathon picked it as his entry into the members' choice polls as a Donathon reward. Which, thank you again for the support, David. The original plan had also been to make this a study, but unfortunately, I think I've burned through all my goodwill on that front for a little bit, and also, I just don't have the brain power to conduct another study. When I wrote that line, I thought I'd be able to make this video 20 minutes or less, so I guess I'm just truly my own worst enemy here. Anyways, this video is about resource extraction, video games, and how your experience of one affects your understanding of the other, starting with... Part 1. Gaming and Resources when it comes to video games, resource extraction is a really difficult balancing act for a developer. It's very, very easy to make the resources either too easy or too difficult to extract, and if your game's balance involves resource extraction in any way, you gotta keep this shit on a tight leash. Basic resources like simple building materials or fuel sources need to be easily accessible as the building block for everything else without being strong enough to justify ignoring more advanced resources. On the flip side, more valuable resources like diamonds or gold need to be rarer and harder to acquire in order to justify their value, while also not being so essential that progress is impossible. We can break games with resource extraction down into one of two categories very broadly. There are games where resource extraction is the whole game, and games where resource extraction is a means to an end. Minecraft would be an example of the former, where the resource gathering is overwhelmingly the focus of the game. You go out into the world to chop down trees, mine resources, and build things with the things you extract. Obviously the game technically ends once you get to the end and defeat the Ender Dragon, but even in terms of combat, your progress is generally dependent on your extraction of resources like diamond, iron, coal, flint, wood, string, and anything else you want to use to build a weapon or some armor. You get food by either harvesting it in the wild or domesticating animals, bringing a wild resource under your management, and then you cook that food in smelters built with extracted resources and fueled by other extracted resources. If this isn't making a lot of sense, you can contrast it with a game like Overwatch, where there's no resource extraction in all combat. Venture isn't digging a hole in the ground to find diamond to improve their drill. Ash doesn't need to kill a creeper to get gunpowder for her dynamite. And Anna doesn't need to whip out a brewing stand, a bottle of water, a glistering melon slice, some nether wart, and some gunpowder every time she wants to chuck a biotic grenade. 
In games like Civilization or Against the Storm, resource extraction is a means to an end rather than the whole purpose. In Civ, you'll build a lumber mill because you want to increase productivity, but you don't ever have to like, you know, manually put the wood through the lumber mill to produce lumber or whatever. In older games, you just send a worker unit out to build shit for you, and in Civ 6, you just have to kill one of your workers every time you want to build a coal mine, which is honestly a pretty low mortality rate for coal mining. In Against the Storm, you assign your villagers to tasks like harvesting resources and chopping down trees, but at the end of the day, the extraction of resources is less about the resources themselves, and more about keeping your settlement alive long enough to complete the actual tasks you've been given. For games like this, resource extraction is still definitely a major component of the game, don't get me wrong, but the game's gameplay and difficulty comes less from having to go out and try and extract all the resources and more about what you do with what you got. In Against the Storm, sometimes you don't have a supply of clay so you can't produce pottery, so you need to find an alternative container if you want to produce something that needs one, like ale or wine. In Civilization, sometimes you start really close to a bunch of iron and coal and can develop a stronger military to take advantage of it, but sometimes you start out with a bunch of luxuries and have to resort to trading and bartering to get those strategic resources. However, you're using those resources to build something else. You're using the lumber, fabric, and bricks of Against the Storm to build new buildings and construct more complex goods, and you're using the strategic and luxury resources of Civ to build military units, improve productivity, and trade with other Civs. The reason this distinction is important is because of the perspective it provides on the resources involved. When we're talking about how games can affect how people perceive resources, the way the game perceives them matters too. Minecraft views resource extraction as something crucial, but personal and laborious. Something where you have to pick up your pickaxe, go out into the mine, and dig for the things you need under potentially dangerous conditions. It's ultimately low stakes, like if you die you just respawn, but it is still dangerous, there's still combat, there's still ways to die. Civilization views resource extraction as a way to limit and enable the overall game. By requiring players to use oil to build tanks, you limit how many tanks a player can produce and create the incentive to either settle around oil, find a way to make a deal with the people who did, or conquer the people who did. Against the Storm views resource extraction as a roguelike puzzle where you'll never be given all the pieces and have to work it out for yourself. Most resources are finite and you'll never get access to all the resources in the game on a single map, so you need to assess the resources that are available and what you can do with them. Obviously, these aren't the only games in the world that do resource extraction, but they're ones that help highlight the specific topics I want to cover in the video, including the topic of our next section. Part 2. Resource Management In most of these games, it's not just what you can extract, but how you manage it. In Minecraft, you need to be able to figure out what you need most, and focus on extracting those materials so you can build it and advance to the next thing you need to build. And against the storm, you need to ensure that your resources are able to meet the basic needs of your population and the demands of the queen before she runs out of patience. And in Civilization, you need to deploy your resources wisely to maximize their impact in terms of economics, productivity, diplomacy, culture, and war. However, this is also where I want to start talking specifically about how this affects our perception of resources, because this aspect of gaming is where I think we start to see the influence more clearly. See, resource extraction isn't just what you do with what you've got. It's all the planning that goes into every aspect of your decision making in games like this. It's about deciding what sort of units to build in Civ based on what resources you currently have, which resources you think you'll have soon, and which resources aren't needed elsewhere more urgently. It's about deciding whether you should use the four diamonds you have left in Minecraft to build a diamond pickaxe to replace one that's nearly broken, or use them to build an enchanting table with the goal of eventually being able to get an unbreaking enchantment to use on a future one. It's about deciding whether you need to spend one of your rare blueprints in Against the Storm on unlocking the plantation so you can sustainably produce plant fibers to make fabric fabric, or whether you should spend that blueprint on a ranch so you can turn the plant fiber you do have into leather and produce more fabric that way. The reason this matters is because the way a game views its resources affects how we interact with them, and in turn, how we start to think about them. Take coal, for example. In most games with resource extraction, coal is a useful fuel source to have on the table because it's one that just about everyone is going to be familiar with on some level, and game devs can rely on your assumptions about coal to inform how you use it as a resource. When you think about coal as a fuel source, you're thinking of something that's more useful than wood, but that's still an older school resource, it's not as efficient as stuff we've developed more recently. From a gameplay stance, coal also allows for you to guide the players if you want them to invest in resource extraction. Minecraft uses coal as one of the quickest ways to force players to start going underground, because you need coal for basic things like torches, while Civ rewards you for extracting coal by allowing you to improve productivity and build new units. And in Against the Storm, you need to either invest in building, improving, and staffing coal mines, or invest in your blueprints into unlocking buildings that can produce coal in other ways. However, because it's often such a valuable fuel source, your management of it matters in all three. In Minecraft, you have to decide whether you want to use coal for torches or for your smelter. In Civ, once you hit the industrial era, you have to decide whether to invest your coal in productivity through factories or warfare through military and naval units. In Against the Storm, you have to decide between using coal to fuel your hearth, cook complex food, produce luxury goods like incense, or produce materials like pottery, pigments, or copper bars that you can use to produce other goods in other buildings. Now, in the real world, this just isn't how resource management works. At least not really. It's not so straightforward and you're not dealing with such easily manageable numbers. I have 50 coal is a sentence that makes sense in all three games and means different but understandable things in all three, but it wouldn't make sense in the real world in terms of like large scale coal mining. However, the more important thing here in terms of both resource extraction and management is that coal in all three games is, all things considered, not that hard to get. And that's by design. 
Hole is meant to be a simple resource that you either eventually upgrade from or that you simply accumulate enough of to have a stockpile that you can fall back on if you need it. In order to do this though, the games also kind of have to make coal sporadic. Access to coal as a fuel source is generally something that requires some degree of planning ahead, and even once you have access to some, you'll eventually need to find other resources for the most part, or you'll run out. This sort of thing is meant to incentivize you to keep exploring further, keep digging deeper, and manage the coal you have responsibly. In Minecraft, you'll find a few dozen coal here, a few dozen coal there, and it's often kind of just... around. In Civ and Against the Storm, coal is a resource that just sits on the world map waiting for you to grab it. That's not how coal works in the real world, obviously. Extracting coal is an incredibly destructive, incredibly resource-intensive industry involving billions of dollars that decimates environments, particularly as time has gone on. In the past, manually digging for coal was very deadly, but it was also relatively less destructive in some ways than current practices like mountain topping, where a company just fucking blows the top off a mountain and scoops out all the coal. In the real world, coal is big business, particularly as a relatively cheap fuel for industrializing nations. Coal isn't something used to build torches or fuel hearts, but to build nations and fuel economic revolutions. The way that video games handle coal makes it seem like something relatively plentiful, if still ultimately limited, something relatively easily and painlessly extracted, and something where you can basically just dig a hole in the ground and find some. Contrast this with, say, precious metals and gems. Gold is an extremely valuable metal for a lot of reasons. Its aesthetics, its conducive properties, its pliability, stuff like that. Viv games focus on gold as a luxury good, with it primarily existing as one of many interchangeable luxury resources that can be traded with other players, while Minecraft focuses on it as a crafting material, and in both cases, devs are relying on your real-world understanding of gold to inform how you engage with it in games. You don't need to be told why gold is a luxury good in Civ, while iron is a strategic good, because even though they're both metals, you know they serve different purposes. Gold in Minecraft isn't super useful for stuff like armor or weapons because it's a soft metal, but it is useful in a lot of crafting applications, particularly stuff like powered rails reflecting its use in electronics in the real world. However, again, these resources have a gameplay function that needs to be kept balanced, so the presence of gold is influenced by what the game needs, not being one-to-one -one with the real world. Mining gold in Civ is the exact same as mining coal. You just find a source on the map and build a mine on top of it. In Minecraft, you generally need to dig way, way deeper to find it, and it spawns less commonly, meaning that it's a more precious resource than the more common metals you find higher up, but also meaning that it can't be a necessary ingredient for anything too essential without making the game too frustrating. Both games affect how we see gold by treating it either as a pure luxury with little to no industrial purpose, or by treating it as an industrial commodity with relatively few uses. Internalizing either of these affects how we perceive gold as a real-world metal, especially in terms of where it shows up. Like, gold definitely can be found deep underground, but it can also be present much closer to the surface. Like, panning for gold was and remains a thing. Gold as a metal is also crucially not something you need to have to manage as a currency or unique economic resource in either game, where gold's real-world applications have very much so involved its role as an economic tool. Whether we're talking currencies that have used gold, or whether we're talking about things like the old gold standard and the gold reserves that countries still hold on to, gold's role in the world is bigger than these games engage with. If anything, Minecraft in particular might lead you to think gold's not really all that useful. It's rare, but it's weak in terms of, like, industrial application and has limited applications beyond that. However, there's a reason why hoarding gold is such a, like, historically common indicator of wealth and power. It's a resource that's not just valuable for its utility or its aesthetics, although it is both, but because its value in both fields, plus as a broader economic tool, means that it's historically been a very useful indicator of power. Stockpiles of gold indicate that you either have a robust resource extraction system and the implied governing authority and state infrastructure to manage it, enough wealth to buy it from others, or enough power to take it from them by force and then defend it. Usually all three. These games use gold because it's a relatively useful shorthand for a valuable metal that's relatively uncommon but still useful as a commodity and manufacturing resource depending on the context. But, if that's the message you internalize about gold, you just aren't getting the full picture. And when it comes to gems, I want to specifically hone in on Minecraft here with two key precious gems. Diamonds and emeralds. Diamonds are, as we all know, a girl's best friend. They're also incredibly strong, incredibly valuable, and incredibly beautiful, and as such are basically one of the most universal shorthands for something that's... Well, strong, valuable, and beautiful, with love being an especially common one thanks to De Beers. They're a huge part of our culture, with countless songs using diamonds as a metaphor for anything from an enduring, everlasting, beautiful love like Diamonds by Rihanna, to a symbol for wealth, power, class, and gender dynamics in Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend by Marilyn Monroe. Madonna's Material Girl music video explicitly references Monroe's performance of Diamonds Are a Girl's Best Friend from Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, with Madonna receiving a diamond necklace right at the beginning and having a mixed reaction. You know, the guy who's giving it to her is still bothering her, but he's giving her a nice gift. I don't want it at all that Kim Petras embraces diamonds as just another symbol of the kind of aspirational wealth that she wants and expects a partner to provide. And if they can't keep providing diamonds to keep her smiling, then she doesn't want it at all. 
I bring all this up because yes, diamonds have industrial value, quite a lot of it, as you probably know, but in the real world their value is so much more complicated than that. In Minecraft, diamonds are the best material out there for armor and weapons thanks to both their strength and durability, and their rarity makes it a long-term project to find enough to produce the things you want. However, in the real world, this just isn't the nature of diamonds. I mean, for one, diamonds aren't exactly something you can craft into solid sheets for armor or make a whole sword out of, but we'll ignore that. The more important thing is that diamonds are not that rare. Diamonds are actually one of the most common gemstones out there. They're not even the most valuable. Other gemstones like rubies, emeralds, and sapphires are rarer and can easily be more expensive. Diamonds are unique because they're the strongest materials on Earth, they're the most scratch-resistant materials on Earth, and that's kind of about it. Don't get me wrong, they're very pretty, but that's not unique. I mean, we even have synthetic diamonds now, but those aren't seen as being as good by a lot of people. The reason why real diamonds are a symbol of wealth and power is because of marketing and management, and the culture has followed along to reinforce that. There were places that valued diamonds for a long, long time, obviously, but they became the unique pop culture symbol of wealth, luxury, and love that they currently are in a lot of countries only within the last century thanks to the De Beers Diamond Corporation. De Beers is a heinous company, we don't have time for them right now. TLDR is that they've basically owned the diamond market for ages and have hoarded diamonds to create false scarcity, driving up prices. They also were the ones to begin marketing diamonds as something to be included specifically in engagement rings with the slogan, Diamonds Are Forever, firmly establishing diamonds and diamonds alone as the gemstone representing eternal love to the average person. You might wonder why they didn't say, like, De Beers diamonds are forever, but when you own, like, 80% of the market, you don't really need to specify. Anyways, thanks to De Beers, diamonds are still far more expensive than they should be, which also makes them a symbol of wealth and class. All those songs from before are building off of not just the immediate messaging of De Beers, but also its impact, with diamonds are a girl's best friend probably being the biggest accomplice in all of this. Contrast this with emeralds, which aren't exactly seen as a symbol of luxury and wealth in the same way. I mean, they're obviously still precious gems, don't get me wrong, but there aren't exactly a lot of top 10 hits about how emeralds are proof that you're rich, or how they're a girl's best friend, or how they prove how much you love someone. However, in Minecraft, emeralds are incredibly rare, similar to the real world, and are the only real currency the game has, unlike the real world. Emeralds are used this way in-game because they just needed something that the average person would be able to think of as being valuable but not particularly useful. Diamonds have a real-world connotation of being both valuable and very strong, making them very useful. In that diamonds are good at the game mechanic as a crafting material in a way that makes them not super useful for a currency. Since Minecraft wants you to go mine for the resources you need to advance the game rather than just trading a bunch of shit with villagers for it. Emeralds could have been any rare gem. In fact, they were originally rubies in Minecraft. They just needed to be something that people would be able to identify as having value but not utility, so they're not trying to craft, like, emerald shovels. In the real world, emeralds are comparable to diamonds in terms of price depending on the quality and often are much more expensive. And they're far rarer. But unfortunately for emeralds, they weren't the beneficiaries of one of the most successful advertising campaigns of all time, so our perception of them just isn't the same. The reason all this matters is because these are still real world resources at the end of the day, and they're not meaningless. Huge multi-billion dollar deals are being struck between governments and private companies for control of and access to these resources, and the balance of power in the world is tied pretty heavily to the resources people have and how they manage them. The way that media shapes our understanding of these resources has an effect on how we understand the world around us, and video games are uniquely capable of influencing us because the interactive elements of these games allows us to engage with the concepts of resource extraction and management that we just don't in other mediums. Or other media, sorry. I know that the plural of mediums is media, but it always sounds wrong saying it that way. Anyways, if your understanding of diamonds is primarily games like Minecraft, which, to be clear, a lot of people aren't going to be getting a particularly in-depth education about diamonds unless they actively decide to study up on them. And even in those cases, there's a good chance they've spent more time thinking about diamonds in the Minecraft context than in, like, the global context. Then you're going to view that resource differently. And that's not great, because their education systems aren't really built for accommodating the ways that video games are influencing how we perceive things. A few decades ago, it wasn't really all that common for kids to spend a lot of time in extremely elaborate resource management games like this. And yeah, I'm saying Minecraft is elaborate because it's not fucking Catan. Prior to widespread commercial access to computers, there were just limits to how much you could really simulate resource management, especially in a way that kids wanted to engage with. But even in terms of the timeline of video games, this is relatively new. Computing power needed to get to a point where games like this could be made and played on hardware the average person could get. But also, game design and development needed to advance as an art form to the point where that devs figured out how to make such complex systems digestible and engaging for everyone, but especially kids. Plus, the internet needed to get to a point where kids could go online and look up how to do stuff like make better pickaxes, which is also ultimately relatively new. All of this together means that it's only in the last couple decades where games involving pretty significant resource management became part of the mainstream in a way that kids, specifically, are going to be engaging with them. And as a consequence, kids are engaging with resource management and picking up lessons about these things in a way no past generation really did. At least not at that age. But so far the video is focused specifically on the ways that games represent resource extraction and management. However, I think we need to focus more on why this is important now. So let's talk about that. Part 3. Power and Politics 
if you want it to be really simple about it, resource extraction and resource management are pretty much just power extraction and power management. The questions, who controls the global supply of coal? And who controls the global supply of oil? Are pretty fundamental questions if you want to figure out who's been running the show for the last few centuries. Part of what helped establish the United Kingdom as not just a naval powerhouse, but an industrial one for so long was that it was the first to capitalize on coal to industrialize, and it paved the way for the future of economics, politics, global power dynamics, and more. To this day, coal is the fuel of choice for industrializing nations due to its relative abundance and low cost in spite of the environmental impact. In fact, a lot of developing countries have argued that the first world's efforts to block coal burning are an effort to pull the ladder up behind them so that countries like China and India can't industrialize the way they did. That's led to both of those countries becoming big investors in the solar energy and other alternatives. However, it's not like that's where it started. European colonialism in particular has always been heavily driven by resource extraction. Colonialism of Australia, Africa, Asia, and the Americas was motivated by resources ranging from coal to lumber, gold to silver, beaver belts to beaded belts, and so much more. Understanding why it was so important to Spain and the explorers it sent out to uncover gold and silver in the Americas, or why France and Britain were willing to spend decades duking it out for control of the fur trade, or why Portugal was setting up colonies in Brazil, or any number of other colonial settlements around the world comes down to understanding why those resources mattered. Understanding the state of the world we live in relies on being able to understand the conditions that brought us to this point, and which continue to motivate it so much. We don't like to call it colonialism or imperialism anymore because empires and colonies are a bit old school, a bit of a yikes, you know, we're not like that anymore. But countries like the United States have done an excellent job of pretending they aren't empires through some clever rebranding and also just not educating people. America has held colonies like the Philippines before, and while it doesn't officially govern a whole bunch of other countries, it will threaten to topple their governments if it gets a bit too anti-American around there, which, you know, has a bit of a cooling effect on other countries, and gives America effective control of a lot of resources. And they're not empty threats either. I've mentioned before how America toppled governments in Central America over bananas, which is where we get the term Banana Republic from, but there's also the annexation of Hawaii being connected to the sugar plantations in the former kingdom. In more recent times, the US has been implicated in the coup d'etats of both Bolivia and Venezuela in 2019, both of which failed, but both of which were argued to have been related to the US wanting to control the resources in those countries. For Bolivia, it was lithium, a metal that is crucial to the manufacturing of lithium-ion batteries that power everything from cell phones to electric vehicles. And for Venezuela, it was oil. Which, hopefully I don't have to explain to you why oil is valuable. The reason this is important is that a lot of valuable resources are finite. There is a limited supply on Earth, sometimes in very limited geographic regions. And so, whoever controls them has a lot of power. Even if the resources themselves are renewable, like crops, like sugar or whatever, you still need room to grow it in suitable climates. Hence why America set up banana republics instead of just growing bananas in fucking Idaho or something. In either sense, they're generally seen as a zero-sum game. A nation's access to coal, or gold, or oil, or diamonds, or bananas reflects how much leverage it has internationally. But as a consequence, also how much risk it's at from people who might want their coal, or gold, or oil, or diamonds, or bananas. It doesn't have to be this way, to be clear, there are enough resources on Earth to sustain all of us, but there's just no profit in that. There's a reason why most countries with a lot of oil set up government-owned companies for managing the extraction, transportation, and management of their oil, and then they form cartels with other oil powerhouses to control prices and maintain stability. And not just some people profit in a private setup, it just isn't really in the best interest of the countries to allow that much power to be taken away from the government. I mean, setting aside my own province being an embarrassment that allows foreign companies owned by foreign governments a lot of the time to own most of our oil and give a fraction of the wealth back to us before abandoning their wells and ruining the province, but who cares about Alberta? Access to resources means access, or vulnerability, to power. Countries like Saudi Arabia and Canada benefit from their oil reserves because of their close relationships with countries like the US, while countries like Venezuela are in a precarious position because of their oil and their refusal to party up with either the Americans or a country that could defend them from the Americans. Diamonds are a huge source of wealth out of Africa, both historically and in the present day, but their value and the chaos left in the post-colonial era has meant that a lot of these diamonds are blood diamonds. Diamonds mined in conflict zones used to finance the conflict. In the modern day, Canada has been accused of perpetuating a form of neo-colonialism through its investment in and attempts to control mining operations in Africa, stealing the wealth of the continent and sending it back to Canadian investors. Canadian security forces have killed dozens of diamond miners who have protested Canadian resource extraction, and there's really been no consequences on the international stage. I mean, odds are, this is probably the first you're hearing of it. These resources aren't a joke. People are willing to kill, or more accurately, send tens of thousands of young people to kill for control of these resources. Powerful countries now and historically have been willing to destabilize entire continents, enslave thousands and thousands of people, and then turn a blind eye when others did the same thing, because pointing the finger would only result in it getting pointed right back at you. Again, there's nothing about playing games like Minecraft that makes you a bad person in some way. And also, there's nothing about Minecraft that makes it or the people who made it fundamentally bad for not trying to incorporate, like, blood diamonds. 
I mean, I guess you can play PvP and get some blood diamonds. However, it's necessary to be aware that these resources aren't just numbers on a spreadsheet or crafting materials in a fictional environment that an individual is collecting or using for their own purposes. And when real-world education is lacking, which it often is with resource extraction, these games have the potential to inform how we perceive these resources on both a conscious and subconscious level, leading to biases that can influence how we see them. That, in turn, can influence how we see the world around us being influenced by those resources. In places where resource extraction is a big part of the political equation, our understanding of resource extraction is really important for evaluating what is or is not a good policy choice and what we should vote for. And that's before even getting into one of the biggest issues surrounding resource extraction. Part 4. The Environment Last section, I promise, and I'll try and keep it reasonably succinct. Editor's note, I failed. I am so sorry, I tried. I promise. In a lot of games with resource extraction, the extraction is clean. Clear-cutting it against the storm doesn't cause soil quality to degrade. Gold mining in Civilization doesn't cause cyanide or mercury to leak into a city's water supply. And going coal mining in Minecraft doesn't give you black lung. These just aren't games about managing environments, they're games about development and extraction for the most part. Adding in environmental management makes them so much more difficult, more confusing, and frankly just less fun. They're also influenced by, frankly, the places where these games are being made. Now, the Gathering Storm DLC for Civ 6 implements some environmental conditions like rising sea levels for pollution, but it's pretty limited and not a fun mechanic to contend with for the most part. I mean, it's not bad, it's just not all that good. In Against the Storm, the settlements are inherently temporary, so there's not really a need to make them sustainable. But the game does have a pollution system in the form of Blight Rod. Blight Rod will spawn in your settlements when you burn a type of fuel called Rainwater, which is basically just magic water. You can burn it in rainwater engines in most of your buildings to improve their productivity, but at the cost of Blight Rot growing in the settlement. Throughout the drizzle and clearance seasons, the player needs to manufacture purging fire in a blight post, and then quickly exterminate it during the storm season before the corruption causes it to start killing villagers. However, this is an overwhelmingly optional mechanic. You don't really ever need to use rainwater for productivity, it's just a choice. And in Minecraft, there isn't really much of anything. Again, understandably, this is a simple sandbox game. It's not really trying to implement rising sea level to be burned too much coal in your smelter, or poison the local water supply if you mine gold too close to it. In fact, the fact that Minecraft is such an individual experience kind of would make it hard to do that at all. In my opinion, this is honestly one of the biggest risks of allowing games to influence how we see resource extraction. Games make resource extraction seem clean, minimally impactful, and generally pretty safe. And it just isn't. And that's particularly important to be keenly aware of as we deal with the real-world impacts of these resources right now. I mean, obviously climate change is a big one, sea levels are rising, wildfires are becoming more common and more deadly, and in countries where the infrastructure is not built to withstand the increasingly dramatic highs and lows that temperatures now hit, people are dying. In Canada, a lot of people are very vulnerable to heat waves because our homes weren't built for handling extreme heat. It's Canada. They're built for handling extreme cold and keeping heat in. A ton of homes in Canada just don't have any form of AC because it wasn't necessary when they were built. But now it is. And the lack of it is particularly dangerous for the elderly who are at a pretty massive risk if a heat wave hits. We saw the reverse of this in Texas, a state built for handling hot weather but not cold. When a cold snap ran through the state and caused blackouts, huge amounts of property damage from burst pipes, and a lot of death. However, it goes beyond just climate change. There's a lot of coal in the Rocky Mountains, they've been mining it for a long time, but Given modern mining strategies, it's become a lot more risky. And if they ever try and dig for it, as the Alberta government has spent years trying to allow Australian companies to do, it will unquestionably poison water supplies across the entire province. The runoff would not only risk making the water unsafe for humans, but also the wildlife in the province. Oh, and also agriculture, and that's a problem for a lot of reasons you might be able to identify if you go to the Wikipedia page for Alberta and scroll down to the section on the economy. Alberta is the top wheat producer in Canada, one of the top five countries for wheat exports globally. Half of all Canadian beef is produced in Alberta, and Canada is a top eight country for beef exports. If those coal mining projects went ahead, it would genuinely cause issues for global food supplies. Crops like coffee are also massively affected by climate change because while it is a crop, and therefore renewable, it is, and we're being polite here, a temperamental asshole of a crop. If you give it like 30 minutes more sun than it wants, or plant it in soil that's not exactly right, or it's a degree too warm or degree too cold for like five minutes, it'll just kill itself. Coffee production in an ideal climate situation is already pretty challenging because it's a petulant brat of a plant, but this is made worse by climate change, as is the case for all crops. The growing cycles of crops, particularly in places with dramatic changes in temperature from season to season, like, I don't know, Canada, are pretty inflexible. You need to be able to plant them by a certain point so they're able to be harvested before the seasons change. But if there's frost a little earlier or later than anticipated, it can decimate the harvest. And this isn't a hypothetical. It's snowing in May right now, like there's snow on the ground where I live. Coffee's an especially good example because it's very valuable, but very precarious, and climate change has already led to many of the farmers who produced it needing to turn to other crops or give up on agriculture altogether. 
Resource extraction also involves a lot of crucial cleanup work even once the resources are all extracted. Replanting trees, cleaning up hazardous waste material, and filling in the disrupted land is essential. But often, it's just not done, or it's done inadequately. Most countries that rely really heavily on resource extraction don't really like to have very strict regulatory agencies that are going to bring the hammer down on these companies. In Alberta, we have a huge issue with abandoned wells, with oil companies either going broke and not being able to clean up their messes, or taking the money and running, leaving Albertans either pay to clean it up, or suffer the consequences. In the games that we play, that's just not how it works. A coal mine in Civ doesn't ever run out, so it also doesn't need to be cleaned up. A coal mine in Against the Storm can run until it's extracted every last piece of coal and then just be demolished with a single click, leaving no trace it was ever even there. Minecraft makes this look especially clean. You can mine a single coal vein without disrupting the environment in a noticeable way, and if you want to do some cleanup, you can just chuck some cobblestone in there and move along. Hell, you can even smelt that cobble into regular stone to make it look like you were never there. Also, importantly, this is a cycle that exacerbates itself. If Canada needs air conditioning and the southern US needs heating as a result of climate change, that requires electricity, and a lot of that electricity is being produced by fossil fuels that exacerbate climate change, increasing the demand for more temperature control, increasing the demand for more electricity, increasing the burning of fossil fuels. Now, can we offset this with solar, wind, hydro, and nuclear? Yes. But, have you seen how many governments are just full of politicians bought and paid for by the people who make billions of dollars from the status quo around fossil fuels? Not that easy, and as things are going right now, I don't have a lot of hope that that's going to happen before it's too late. If it becomes harder to grow grain, fewer places are able to grow it, and more places will need to rely on imports. Transporting grain around the globe burns fuel, exacerbating climate change and making it harder and harder to produce food sustainably. And also, as we've seen in the past, global supply chains can be pretty vulnerable. For countries where the economy benefits significantly from the export of cash crops like coffee, climate change risks throwing their country into instability. And instability tends to lead to conflict. And conflict is bad for everyone, except the military-industrial complex. Uh, speaking of, conflict is also very bad for the environment. Setting aside all the environmental damage that's caused by bombs, bullets, exploded buildings, and having to try and build back afterwards, global military emissions account for nearly 6% of all global carbon emissions. And, as noted by The Guardian, if the global military were a country, it would be the fourth largest emitter in the world, between Russia and India. And, as climate change and the environmental impacts of resource extraction at large continue to damage water supplies, we're going to see more conflict over access to things like fresh water, which also not great for the environment, or the lives of the people who are going to end up dying over control of the Great Lakes or whatever. When our understanding of resource extraction is primarily guided by the lessons we subconsciously pick up from these games, and when we don't have robust, well-funded public education systems that educate us about these impacts, and when we have powerful people made wealthy by the status quo surrounding these resources buying propaganda to undermine the facts, we risk losing sight of all of that. It makes us less likely to view decisions to increase oil production, or chop the top off a mountain to get some coal, or clear-cut the Amazon as being as serious as they are. This isn't to say that these video games are failing us, because it isn't Minecraft's responsibility to implement a realistic simulation of ecological damage or emphasize the importance of land reclamation. The bigger problem here is that a lot of people, especially younger people, people who are growing up right now, don't tend to learn a lot about resource extraction in school. Especially because discussions of environmental issues and the economics of resource extraction are pretty contentious topics politically, and a lot of money is spent making sure nobody starts getting any ideas. This is a problem in and of itself, because as this video is hopefully hammered home, this is an important subject with a lot of impacts on our daily lives. But it is an especially big problem when paired with the reality that a lot of kids are growing up playing games that, in the absence of a proper education, are going to lead them to have skewed understandings of these resources on a subconscious level, and misinformed kids become misinformed adults. Again, the games aren't the problem. Minecraft isn't doing something wrong. It's just unintentionally revealing a weak point in how we handle education because there hasn't historically been a huge risk of kids being exposed to a sanitized, black lung-free version of coal mining where they aren't at risk of having their fucking fingers blown off. And it also isn't the fault of people who play these games, obviously. Again, you're not a bad person for enjoying Minecraft. But we do know that this affects people because the gamification of anything makes it more enjoyable. Farming games make farming seem more fun, city builders make municipal management seem more fun, and mining games make mining seem more fun. The children yearn for the mines because they're being shown the least harmful, most enjoyable possible version of them. And that's fine, it's a game, it just shouldn't be their only source of information when it comes to the mines. It's especially important because, unlike stuff like war games, the realities of resource extraction are already much less readily apparent. It's a lot easier to look at Call of Duty and recognize the ways in which real-world conflict is different than it is to look at Minecraft and recognize the ways in which real-world coal mining is different and having different impact, especially as a kid. Video games are a really, really powerful medium. They're great. I want to emphasize again, I don't think the games are bad for failing to encapsulate the entire reality of resource extraction and management, because it's not really their job any more than it's the job of Michael Bay's Transformers movies to teach people car maintenance. I enjoy all these games, and I don't think I'd enjoy them more if they were massively overhauled to try and be more realistic in terms of the bigger picture of resource extraction. 
point of the video is to hopefully convince people to think about the ways that their experience with games might affect how they perceive real-world resources, and to discuss why it's important to have broader understandings of the topic. I think it's also possible to have games where this is explicitly part of the game and make it fun. Terra Nil is like a reverse city skylines where you're tasked with transforming a barren wasteland into a healthy, balanced ecosystem using the same kind of mechanics you'd usually see in city builders. We don't need to be angry at games that treat resources the way that these games or others do, and I'm not trying to do that. I, I feel like I'm kind of hammering this home a lot because I'm really worried about being taken out of context on this one. But anyways, this is because video games aren't generally simulations. Bullet wounds don't heal after a few seconds of crouching behind a wall, conversations aren't two people taking turns selecting options from a pre-selected menu, and music isn't made by pressing five buttons on a plastic guitar. The difference is that those are pretty obvious on their surface, and the reality of resource extraction is just a lot less apparent. It requires a real investment in education to show the full range of this topic, and I think failing to do so has been and likely will continue to be a real disservice to generations of people around the world. Anyways, thank you for watching. This video was meant to come out last week, and then also yesterday, but I'm glad I took the time to work on it instead of trying to half-ass it while I was finishing up the Inescapable video. If you enjoyed this, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and consider becoming a channel member. Memberships cost $5 a month and really help support the channel, and channel members get to pick one topic a month for me to make a video about. This video topic was chosen by my channel members in April out of these five topics, and if you'd like to join them, you can click the join button below. The poll for May is going on right now between these five topics, assuming you're watching this before midnight on May 7th. First is why listen to the players doesn't work. A returning topic from January, this one is about why listening to feedback is a lot harder than people recognize, and the reasons why just listening to the players isn't nearly as smart of advice as people think it is. Next, there's what is Overwatch supposed to be, a returning topic from February that would try and answer the question of what Overwatch is supposed to be as a game and what it would have to do to achieve that. Then there's Blizzard's Panopticon isn't working, another returning topic, this one from March, focused on why the style of moderation used for Overwatch and other online games fails to actually moderate player behavior. And rounding out the returning topics, we have Drag Queens, VTubers, and Jester's Privilege. A returning topic from December, March, and April, this one would be about how performing through the facade of a character allows an entertainer unique privileges that they otherwise wouldn't be able to access. Lastly, there's Hero Bands Aren't the Solution, a new topic for May that would discuss how and why Hero Bands Aren't the Solution to the issues Overwatch is facing. If you'd like to vote for one of these topics, voting will be open until midnight on May 7th. If no topic has a majority by that point, there'll be a runoff between the top two. As well, this month I'm going to be doing a little mini donathon for my birthday. It'll mostly be over on Twitch, but I'll be doing a stream on May 12th at 9am Mountain Time here on YouTube as well. There are a bunch of rewards for both individuals and the community, including making a video live on stream from start to finish, as well as a second member's choice poll in May between these five topics. Uh, well, between these four, plus whichever one takes second from the one that's happening right now. Anyways, if you'd like to support the donathon and get some of these rewards, it'll start on May 11th at 9am on twitch.tv slash theviveros, and will run until the timer runs out. And that will include channel memberships purchased while the donathon is ongoing, so you can get two birds with one stone if you sign up while it's going on. Anyways, that's enough of a plug, I apologize for that. There's also hopefully going to be another video out next Friday, so hopefully you'll be able to enjoy that as well. I can't really imagine anything hitting the numbers that these last few videos have, and honestly, I'm kind of looking forward to having a more manageable moderation situation for a little bit. Lastly, thank you very much to all of my channel members. Mini Q, Olesp, Cage of the Orc, Fish Toast, Alex Stone, Nemo the Survivor, Dexiny, Yoshi of the Wire, CatLover192, Sourdough, It's Peggy BTW, Aluma Riley, Cadence, Windex the Great, V, The Leathers, Gvoss, Marsh Alice, Crimson Cyclo, Jules Coolness, Good Guy Luis, Cacteen Kushler, Aikri, Hallucigeno, and MV. Whether you're a member, a subscriber, or you just stop by to check out a video, Thank you very much for watching, and I hope I'll see you around again soon!